So hello, everybody. Welcome to the Innovate From Anywhere webinar. So here we'll discuss how to get the most out of a remote team and working with remote teams. My name is Jolie Hales. I'm with Rescale, and I will be your moderator. So a little bit about this webinar. Let's take a look at the agenda first off. So we're going to start by interviewing Mike Krawczyk, who is principal engineer at McCormick Stevenson, about how they approach HPC simulation, remote teams, as well as how he sees the future of engineering. And then after that, we'll give you a quick overview of the Rescale platform. And then we'll actually do a CFD demonstration of a popular sci-fi space fighter that will remain nameless at this time. Uh, but I will say, may the cores be with you. <laughs> I'm sorry. So to kick us off, we're going to start with interviewing our special guest, Mike Krawczyk, who is a principal engineer at McCormick Stevenson, which is a company that engineers rugged solutions for aerospace, defense, and homeland security. And a little bit about Mike, he has 30 years experience in mechanical engineering design and analysis, and he uses his stress and thermal analysis passion and expertise to give McCormick Stevenson customers the confidence they need to move forward with their designs. Now, Mike is a mechanical, mechanical engineer from Georgia Tech and a state of Florida licensed professional engineer. And in his free time, he likes to backpack with friends, travel with his family, or research his family tree. Mike also serves the citizens of, of the city of Tampa as a part-time EMT. So he's also on the front lines of our health as well. <clears throat> and Mike will be interviewed by Sean Hansen, who's the chief operating officer at Rescale. A little bit about Sean before joining Rescale, Sean was the CMO at Heap and also the CCO at Mixpanel. And he's held a number of senior leadership roles at Microsoft and Cisco Systems. He has a Bachelor's of Arts in Humanities from Brigham Young University, as well as an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. On a personal note, Sean enjoys music with his family, reading great literature and strategy books, and you may have seen him star in one of our recent commercials for this webinar where he attempted to work in front of some of his children who were playing the trombone and cymbals behind him. Uh, definitely an amusing thing for us to see here at Rescale. That being said, Sean Hansen, I will go ahead and turn the time over to you and Mike. Thanks, Julie. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you very much for those of you joining us remotely. We're excited to have you join us at this webinar. Um, we are going to focus today's discussion around uh, our new um, work from home scenario where we're trying to innovate from anywhere. Um, welcome to Mike and McCormick Stevenson. Really grateful to have you on today's webinar. I wonder if we can kick off with just a little bit of background. I'm um, super uh, interested in what you've been doing and you're a little bit of a best practice with um, some of these um, kind of new workflows that have emerged. Tell us a little bit about McCormick Stevenson and the engineering work that you conduct. Sure, Sean, and thank you very much for including me and McCormick Stevenson in this uh, webinar. Um, we're we're a mechanical engineering and design firm in Clearwater, Florida, the Tampa area of Florida. We were founded in 1999. Um, we've always concentrated on the defense sector and solutions for our warfighters. Um, some examples of things that we've done: uh, we we do a, we've done a lot of electronics packaging, especially in pretty harsh environments like uh, helicopters. Um, uh, tracked vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, we've we've uh, done a lot of guided munitions, both um, missiles and guided ballistic uh, projectiles. Um, we've done a lot of work in high G environments, um, the big guns, like in the tanks and uh, you know army tanks and navy uh, type type big guns. We're generally um, a subcontractor to and trusted by uh, a lot of major defense contractors. And I, I just have to add, you you won't find a better group either technically or character-wise in this group. It's just, it's an incredible company. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about your role within this organization and um, what has been ex kind of exciting projects you've been working on in the engineering team. Sure. Um, we uh, I started here about 15 years ago as an engineer and a, a budding analyst at that time. I was one of about eight employees um, when I started. Uh, we've we've gone through ups and downs just like everyone, but it's been um, majority very successful, and we're up to about 50 50 employees now. 
uh, anywhere from uh, interns uh, to what I call seasoned Oracle on the mountaintop type guys that have forgotten more than I've ever learned. Um, and uh, there's five of us in the analysis group. Um, I'm now a principal engineer, which I think just means that I have more gray hair than some of the other guys. Um, and uh, uh, I'm also the analysis group technical lead. So very cool. Um, you know, there's a, if you look at the list of attendees on today's call, there's many people that are in the simulation field or working on similar work that you are. Um, tell us about some of the common uses of simulation at McCormick Stevenson, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about your use of cloud. Sure. Well. Um, the main use for simulation, I think anybody that really gets deep into simulation will agree with me. It's, you know, it, I, I'm a fully admitted nerd. It's cool and it's fun to me to do, but that's not a good reason to do it. Um, we we use simulation purely to reduce risk for our customers. So it's it's much cheaper to modify a part when it's on the computer in CAD than to um, modify it after you've actually produced some parts or tested parts. So um, we, we use our simulation ability to reduce risk uh, as they move forward. Um, as far as getting towards specific projects, our, um, the American military has really been implementing over the past years um, uh, what they call a swap program, where they want to reduce size, weight, and power. Um, that increases the cost efficiency of, of the, the products they buy and the effectiveness. So it, it reduces collateral, collateral damage. You know, if we can um, make things more accurate and that kind of thing, where we we, we want to hit what we want to hit and not hit what we don't want to hit. Um, so we we test products against uh, MIL standard 810 um, shock vibration acceleration type uh, environments, um, other client imposed environments. We we've done um, a specialized projectile that. Uh, it was a, a, a ballistic projectile, but it had to have a minimum wall casing thickness. Um, and we uh, we did a nonlinear analysis to kind of iterate the wall thickness on that casing in, in the environment, the high G environments it was going to see to get that, um, that wall thickness we needed. Um, we actually redesigned the tow missile launcher. Um, people might know that as that's the missile. It's a land land launched missile that um, you see when it fires, it has a wire guide that's dragging behind it, and that, that wire guides the missile. We redesigned that launcher to go from a, um, a cast aluminum uh, part to um, very high strength plastic parts that were much more efficient for maintainability and cost. Uh, we did testing on Rescale for that um, to, to help redesign that. Um, We've we've done transient analysis of electronics in uh, in missiles. Um, we had one where we, because of the profile of this missile, it had a very low heat dissipation over a period of time, but it had aerodynamic heating, so we needed to keep that heat out. But then we had a when it actually turned on, big time in the end, uh, it had a huge spike of heat that we had to dissipate in a short period of time. So we had competing requirements there and um, it was right on the edge. So uh, again, that was another case where we used Rescale to help us uh, um, solve that problem. So that, that swap goal really makes our hitting our, our goals challenging because everything's getting smaller and smaller, but we're packing more power into it. And um, it's tough to hit that without, without good simulation. That's fascinating. Tell us, tell me, you can tell the audience a little bit about the environment you're in. What kind of software applications you use and the, the hardware platforms? Sure. For for CAD, we use uh, mainly Creo and SolidWorks, um, and we're pretty much an ANSYS house for for simulation. Um, but we we really kind of we're we're a, a we're a service company. We're an engineering services company, so we we tend to maneuver around what our clients need. So if we have a set of clients that need SolidWorks for this and ANSYS for, the, for simulation, we'll, we'll solve that. If they need a specific revision of each of those softwares, we, we have multiple revisions on, on our computers that we can use. So, so we, try to, we try to bend what we do to, to match our clients' needs there. Hmm. I've been fascinated with uh, the shift that you've made from more, the more legacy existing hardware and on-premise products to using the cloud more and more. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what spurred the need to find an alternative solution to your legacy solutions and what that journey has been like for you. Sure, sure. We we really found that we needed an ability to to scale. Um, you know, we 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 were we were solving jobs in house, and we have a we have a, a 
a group of systems that we can use for that. We have laptop, each of us have individual laptops that can solve uh, relatively small scale type simulations. Um, we have a server, uh, a compute server that we can send bigger jobs to, but more and more we're getting jobs that overwhelm that server and that's when we jump to rescale when we need we need to to scale something bigger or if we need to um, we need to iterate you know uh, quickly so uh, we might we might have a job that's not super big where we could still solve it on our machine but we want to iterate really fast so we can uh, meet our schedule requirements for our clients so that that's those are generally the reasons we would use rescale there hmm. Could you compare and contrast what speed to iterate is like in the old world versus a cloud first world? The, it, it totally depends on the job, but we um, uh, anybody that uses Ansys knows that um, there's a dreaded message that you get at the beginning of a job where you're solving the, 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 the analysis out of core, which means that it's not using memory on the machine anymore. It's, it's writing to disk instead of memory. And uh, when you get that, you know your analysis is going to take a long time. So, um, you know, in that, we, we've had jobs where, uh, again, we would stop them and put them up on rescale at that point, but we would predict based upon the, the, the rate that it was solving that it would literally take days to finish the solve and rescale has finished it within hours, depending on which, uh, um, which cluster we use on rescale. How many different core types do you tend to leverage across your various workflows? I would say it, 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 it depends on um, on the user. We have multiple users of Rescale, but um, we I, I generally there's four or five that I generally choose from, um, and it really depends on whether it's a it's a job that needs more memory or more disk space. You know, because you have different combinations of cores there that offer um, high memory or high disk space requirements, and um, it you know it, it just depends on what what the job looks like from a, from a need standpoint. So we can we can vary between high memory or high um, disk space requirements there. Can you describe a little for the audience how moving to a cloud-first environment, maybe with Rescale, helped optimize your team and increase those efficiencies you talked about? I think the next level of detail would be really fascinating for this audience. Sure, sure. It, it, Rescale truly is, for us, like having another, you know, extremely powerful computer in the office. Uh, I mentioned we have kind of two levels of solve in the office. That gives us a third, nearly unlimited um, option. Um, you know, it, it was important to us that it be that kind of an environment where we're, where it's it's just like using another computer in the office to us. And I, I really have to give it to your behind the scenes folks here. The, the interface is incredible. It's an incredibly intuitive and easy to use interface. Um, when we do have issues that we can't solve, your support team answers literally in minutes or hours. It's never never days. So we, we, we've, we've always had incredible uh, um, experiences on Rescale. Um, what we do get with Rescale is the the latest um, the latest uh, processors, you know. So instead of investing, making a heavy investment on a on a new solve machine for our office, which could get into five figures, we we can spend some money on Rescale to get that that same compute power. And the cost, if you look at the cost on Rescale, it's it's generally in the insignificant range compared to our man hours on the job. So it's it's easy to pass those costs on to our client in a manner that, that they are not going to be hurt by. And um, one big thing this does for us, you know, the rescale costs are nearly insignificant for the job, but licensing for, for ANSYS, you know, it's an incredibly powerful um, program, but you have to pay for that power. So licensing costs are not, are not cheap, but what, Rescale does for us is allow us to solve jobs faster so we can free up licenses for another job and it, it pushes off our need to, to purchase additional licenses um, to a later time, you know, so it, it helps us with cash flow there. Thank you. You know, I think top of mind for many of us is the work from home environment and considering that your team has to work from home right now. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your workflows have changed and the tools that you put in place to let your teams function? without delay or with that speed iteration you talked about? Well, we I have to give it to our management here. We we were fully prepared for this even before COVID became a common term. We um, our, our management always wanted us to be as effective in the office um, or out of the office, I'm sorry, as we are in the office. So whether we're at home or at a client site, 
Um, we we use uh, VPN software to to link into our, our server here. Um, we have uh, we use Microsoft Teams for for internal uh, communication, but um, you know, as far as solving, we can remote in using the Microsoft tools to remote into our, our desktops um, and solve either locally on our um, on that compute server I mentioned, um, or you know, with with Rescale, we can we can kick off a job you know before we leave the office or even at home, kick off a job on Rescale and then check it from anywhere. I've I've literally checked my Rescale runs at halftime at my son's soccer games you know on, on my phone so i mean it's uh it, you can you can kick it off at home or at, at work and then check it anywhere uh, talk a little bit about how a cloud first environment has helped you in this kind of environment with sharing and collaborating um vpning to a to a desktop i think that's something we've had for a long time but moving to a cloud first environment how has that impacted you well we um you know we, we we could generally store, you know, everything we need up on Rescale. Um, we can share it, so you know, it, it's it's accessible by my multiple analysts if we need to. Um, we uh, it, it just it, it allows us to consolidate um, our um, our jobs in a way that we we couldn't before, you know. So um, instead of having uh, um, uh, uh, an analysis on this machine where we'd have to copy it over to another machine we uh, we now have everything on the cloud where we can we can easily give access to other analysts if we need them to review that kind of thing great if you were to compare and contrast um, say a couple of years ago with your legacy systems versus the, what you have deployed now what results would you how would you describe the results that you're seeing and how would you quantify that well I think the biggest difference for us is is uh, the speed you know um, we you know the the analyses that we're we're getting deeper deeper into what we do, and that just means more um, complexity in our analyses. Um, so we need more horsepower on our compute to to solve, um, and more speed to iterate. You know we we don't want to wait days when we're trying to iterate and just find out we need to iterate again. So you know having having that ability to um, to solve quickly so we can iterate fast and 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 also you know get the job done in time for our client is important to us cool can you describe a few of the use cases um, where your team has relied on on this technology i know that for many of us you give us a microscope into what is a black box really for many of us we see really cool things happening but tell, tell us a little bit about a few of the interesting use cases where you've been able to deploy this and what you've seen happen Sure, we we um, we were doing a job for a client that involved um, a guidance package for um, a a missile, and this job it, it was a very very schedule crunched job. We had probably a hundred separate large analyses we had to do within a one month total project time. So that was from you know issuance of PO to you know issuance of the final report. Um, we there was no way we can get that done with what we what we what we had locally as far as compute power so we we sent a lot of jobs up to rescale um, we had some running in house it was a combination it was an organization a, a big time organization effort and we um, we had a really successful uh, completion of that job there to to give them the the confidence they needed to move forward with that guidance package um, that was more of a structural job. We did do a, um, a thermal analysis on a, a job where we had a um, lots of uh, um, military type products like the missiles and stuff have what are called thermal batteries um, where you can get a lot of power out of that battery in a short amount of time. Um, but it's a, it's a very hot process that, that it's going through there. Uh, and we did, we did a thermal analysis on, on a thermal battery for a client and they they had always done this internally by uh, kind of looking at bulk properties for the materials that are inside the battery but they wanted a little more refinement for that so we were able to between you know the 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 skill that we had to put together the analysis and and the the horsepower we had on rescale we were able to model that thermal battery with all of the there's there's hundreds of individual little components inside there um, and we were able to give them a, a, a detailed look at what's going on thermally in that battery that they had never had before. They they, they came out of that totally impressed with uh, you know 
how our results matched their their tests. You know, we, we they validated our our analysis with with testing, and it was just a it was a very successful job. Awesome, thank you. There there are many people on the call today who are just starting to make this journey, and I think you represent a team that has successfully made the leap um, from on premise into uh, maybe a hybrid or a cloud environment. Can you give any guidance to those who are looking for trusted advisors, maybe to help them? What could be a very nuanced and complicated space. What other, what kind of factors did you consider when you were looking at alternative solutions for compute and simulation? Well, what was important to us was uh, I, I kind of summarized some of the stuff I said before. Uh, horsepower was important. We had to have something that was more powerful than what we had in the office, otherwise it wouldn't be useful for us. Uh, and that leads to speed, speed of iteration. So uh, we have the power to iterate quickly. Um, cost efficiency is uh, um, is important to us, but that, like I mentioned, the 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 rescale costs are are generally insignificant compared to man hours on the job. So that's a little lower on the scale. Um, usability was incredibly important to us. We didn't want to have to you know, spent, sent, have people train for days or weeks trying to figure out how to use the interface and the rescale interface is, is, is incredible. Um, it, it, you, you can pick it up, you know, first time you walk through it. Um, one thing that was very important to us and when we initially looked at, looked into uh, using cloud resources, I would say six or seven years ago, um, we, we needed, because of the work we do, we had to comply with the international trafficking and arms reg regulations, the ITAR regulations, and there's uh, follow on to that FedRAMP regulations that, that basically specify, um, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but it specifies you know, how secure the, uh, um, the data is on those, on those uh, compute clusters. And at the time when we were looking, Rescale was the only uh, service that we found that, that could meet that requirement. And you guys have, have progress to the point of meeting the FedRAMP requirements, which is not an easy set of requirements to meet. And um, that's that's important to us because th th those those kind of requirements are being fed to us and we have to pass them down. And, and if we can't pass them down, we can't use the, um, the service. Thank you. If you were to describe, we have a question from the audience about what is Rescale? And we have new people that have joined us for the first time. How would you describe what Rescale is and the benefits it offers to a, somebody brand new trying to move to the cloud? Sure, uh, Rescale is is a cloud compute service. So you're you're basically uh, buying um, CPU hours on, on Rescale, but it's uh, it, it's it's like having another computer sitting at your desk, but a very very powerful computer. So you don't have to buy a new you know 32 core machine to to solve you know a, a big job. You, as long as you have the licensing, you can go on a rescale, and all that all that power is there for you to use. And you you upload a batch file for your job, submit it. And there's there's other options besides batch. You can do an interactive type type work session as well. Um, but it, it truly is like having another incredibly powerful computer sitting at your desk there. It's it's been easy with for us as we partner with the leading cloud service providers like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Uh, to place the, the in the cloud, and we it's been a great um, it's been a great joy to be able to see these uh, new these new SKUs and technologies emerge very quickly and rapidly, and to be able to offer that to the market across the the, the choice of vendors. Um, one last big kind of thought question for you, and we'll close on this question. Um, sure. We often ask, look at the what's happening with the cloud and how quickly it's developing. Um, what would you do if you had access to unlimited compute? Meaning, if that um, if that limit went away and the compute became more limited and, and essentially ubiquitous and cheap, how would you see uh, McCormick Stevenson's approach to innovation changing? What would you see changing in your team? I, I think what it would mean to us is that it, it would it would obviously give us more computation ability, so we can do more detailed analysis. Um, and what that means is that our analysis models become closer to reality. I mean, by definition, a finite element analysis is is a finite representation of, of, of reality. So um, the more power you have, the closer you can uh, you can make that that simulation to reality. And what that leads to is you know lower risk for our clients, uh, less cost for our clients because they have that lower risk. And you know, eventually, you know, if if we reach the 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 singularity point on this, um, we would no longer need to test products if we could if we could fully, completely, and accurately simulate products 
uh, in the cloud or, or you know, uh, in our simulations, there wouldn't be any testing requirement because, you know, you would know it would pass because you're simulating reality as close as uh, as, as you could. So, so it would it would lead to no more testing for our require for our clients, which would lead to lower costs for them. They could just go straight to uh, to production. Well, we are excited to partner with you, and it really blazes the trail to uh, help help move to the cloud and in this new world where we're working more remotely more than ever um, to see what happens as things keep progressing. Thank you very much for taking some time with us today. Really appreciate well, thank it. You. Thank you very much for including us. Yes, thank you. Totally to off of to you now for the fun of games. Fantastic. So if anybody does have a question for either Mike or Sean, feel free to write that in the next few seconds. We do have one question from Matthew, but I'm going to hang on to that and let our senior solutions architect answer that at the end. So hang tight, Matthew. We'll get to that question for sure. Um, otherwise, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions for Mike or Sean, so we will forge ahead here. If anybody does have any, we can always address them at the end as well for both of them. So from here, we're going to press forward. So for those of you who are new to Rescale, let me get my uh, camera going just for fun. Here we go. Uh, so for those of you who are new to Rescale, I wanted to let you know we're an HPC simulation platform that's designed to provide highly agile and powerful compute resources to engineers and to scientists. So the platform was designed for flexibility to better meet demand. And the idea is that if you give engineers more specialized compute, software, and enhanced workflows, then you increase their ability to innovate. And that's what we're all about, innovation. So engineers and scientists are empowered to efficiently discover new medicines, design safer cars, uncover new energy sources, or change the way we travel, just to name a few, through Rescale. Traditional HPC, on the other hand, is more of a fixed model. It cannot easily scale or adapt to new initiatives, changes in the market, or accelerate development. So you can see in this graph here that the demand on HPC resources consists of bursts, followed by inactivity. And then that, that line there, that dotted line, represents the capability of an on-prem system. So during the burst work periods, the system is overwhelmed, causing delays and prolonging development. On the other hand, Rescale adjusts to meet even the highest demands during burst periods, as you can see here. So to achieve flexibility and to optimize workflows, Rescale is built on top of a multi-cloud infrastructure with more than 370 simulation applications and that's always growing. This means that you get the latest hardware, software at any scale and tuned to your specific project. And we designed Rescale to be used by engineers anywhere in the world. The current situation has highlighted the strengths of a cloud platform and its unique ability to enable remote teams to innovate, as many of us are remote. I'm remote right now. Uh, because we are built on a public cloud infrastructure at Rescale, it doesn't matter where you're located or where you're accessing the platform. It's always the same interface. So you have access to on-demand clusters at any scale to tackle even the largest workload, flexible software license options where you can buy, bring your own, or use on demand. You can spin up a virtual desktop to handle work that's too intense for your home equipment. Workflows are optimized and allow easy collaboration between your team members, and it's fully secure, as we heard from Mike and Sean, and compliant with certifications from ITAR, SOC2, and even FedRAMP, which is not a common thing that you'll find in Cloud HPC. Uh, and for more, and that's all great for sensitive data, security concerns, we address all of that. So we could show you how the platform at this time enables remote teams with a typical demo, or we can show you with the fun and nerdy version. Obviously, we're going to go with the fun and nerdy. So here we go. Bear with me here. But we are a group of space rebels. We have orders to fly to a distant planet and protect a unit that is under attack from the Empire. But the planet has a very dense atmosphere, and there is concern that our ships cannot withstand the pressure. In order to determine that our spacecrafts can safely enter the atmosphere, we need to enlist our two best engineers. The problem is they are in two different sectors or planets. Stephen is located in the planet of North Carolina, and Madhu is located on the planet of Chicago. They will need to work together to come to a quick answer. So we're going to demonstrate what this looks like in just a few minutes, but Stephen and Madhu will need to first access the servers 
the secure server. They'll need to collect ship designs, create a mesh, run the entry simulation, and interpret the results. So while the engineers get underway, we wanted to take a quick poll. So for those of you who are Star Wars nerds, um, this might be kind of fun. Uh, Steven and Madhu will be running CFD on two different spacecrafts, the iconic X-Wing and the Millennium Falcon. And we're curious which of these you think will perform better in the simulation. So we're gonna ask you two polling questions. Feel free to answer them in your window in front of you. Uh, the first question is, which do you believe is a more aero, is more aerodynamic, the X-Wing or the Millennium Falcon? Go ahead and answer that question. All right, so our poll results, 52% said X-Wing, 48% said Millennium Falcon. Okay, let's go to our second one. That's interesting. So the second question is, which spacecraft design is most likely to withstand the dense atmosphere of this distant planet, this dense planet? The X-Wing or the Millennium Falcon? All right. A lot of you have voted. Let's go ahead and see those results. So the X-Wing is at 25% and 75% said Millennium Falcon. That makes sense because Millennium Falcon's pretty beefy. It's a beefy space, spacecraft. Okay, well, let's find out. Let's see what the actual results are. So I'm gonna turn the time over to our solutions architects team of Madhu and Steven to actually run through this and see which of these spacecrafts would work best. Steven and Madhu, I am going to cut my camera and turn it over to you. All right, how's that? There we go, now we can hear you, perfect. I guess the, the wilds of planet Charlotte are a little too crazy for us right now. I guess can't handle this, this, uh, <laughs> this internet. Um, all right, so great. So we have a task and we're trying to look at uh, whether or not one of these spaceships can handle this dense atmosphere. Now, um, all I have is this browser, right? I, 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 I kind of to flee the uh, on-premise Imperial Army uh, with my iPad and that's all I've got here. Um, so I need to be able to, to, to run the simulation um, uh, with my colleague Madhu uh, and we're both going to try to figure out whether or not we can successfully uh, enter in this atmosphere of this planet and, and be able to uh, perform some rebel sabotage. Um, so I've got a model here of the X-Wing that I've already created before. Um, I think it looks okay to me. Um, you know, I, I'm more on the um, thermal system side of things, and, and I'm not necessarily a, an expert on the meshing side of things. So. I've set things up based on the geometry uh, that I've gotten from, from our on the ground crew uh, who maintains the, the, uh, the X-Wing. I've set that up and I've created a mesh. Um, I think it's okay, but I'm, I'm gonna need to pull in some support here from Madhu who's in Chicago to verify that my mesh is set up correct. So I wanna show you guys, um, I have this model. Um, I'm gonna go to the platform and I want to um, share this job with Madhu, and I'm going to, I need his help because uh, we need to get this 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 up and running, this simulation. So I've I've done the basic work, I've cleaned up the CAD, I simplified some of the geometry, some of the issues with that. Uh, but now I need to make sure my mesh is right, and I've done a mesh, but you know Madhu is really the mesh expert, and so this job right here is already attached to my desktop. So again, I, I all I have is my iPad. Uh, Source System Plus does not work on an iPad, right? So um, I've been using this virtual desktop on uh, on Rescale, and I have this job attached to that to to that desktop. Now I'm going to share this job with Madhu. Madhu, are you there? Perhaps he's there. Madhu, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. There you are. Hey, Madhu. All right. So I'm going to share this with you. Um, I can type. And then here we go, CAD of X-Wing. All right, so I'm gonna share that with you, uh, Madhu. And I need your help on, on looking at that, that mesh and help me correct if I have any issues with that mesh um, uh, for the simulation. So I'm gonna pass the ball over to you. Okay, it looks good to me. 
All right, so let me pull up my mesh then, and let's let's look at that together because uh, I'm not sure that I created this correctly. Um, let me hide some of this stuff here um, and go through and change my parts list so I can show you the correct, at least, at least a profile of the mesh, right, um, of this X-Wing fighter. Um, that's my environment. Um, let's see here. I've got the mesh around the X-Wing yeah. there. Can I zoom um, in a bit? I just want to make sure that uh, we are able to capture all the, you know, the boundary layer. Should, and the should, should, I bring up the, yeah. should I bring up the surface of the X-Wing? Because this doesn't, is this helping you? Does this look okay? I mean, I, I entered in some mesh conditions I thought were okay. I don't know if that's right or not. Um, let me see if I can change this real fast. Yeah, that looks good. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I okay. just wanted to make sure that, yeah, that's perfect, yep. So the setup looks okay, and the fact that I'm using a trimmer mesh and all looks fine to you. So, I mean, do you see any issues with that, or am I good to, I mean, you think it's probably worth testing to see if uh, the simulation will run all right on this one? Uh, or do, yeah, are I they don't any issues. I don't see any issues in the mesh. Uh, so I'm just curious, like, what is the size of the mesh? Uh, we've got a, well, the representation, let's see here. We are at, yeah, 1.4 million cells, so not that big. Um, is my, you think my size, my mesh is, is adequate here? Or maybe I should change the base size real fast. Uh, we can change, but I think for a baseline design, this looks good. We can always I take so it back. Good. All right. So um, let me, uh, so we have this base mesh here um, and, and I want to, you know, you know I've heard before that, um, I, I think my, my base mesh size is off. I wanna increase the, the, the accuracy of that. So let me, um, let me do a save as here and let's send this off to, um, let's save this off to, Rescale, uh, and maybe let's get a mesh going real fast on this. Um, I think if you know if I double if I have the base size, that should roughly double my, my mesh, right? If that were if that were correct. Yeah, that should be it. So I think we can also get some fidelity on the model too. Okay, so let's uh, mesh our X wing here. I'm going to add it from my desktop that I just worked on there um, here and let that upload to the platform. It already has a mesh on it, so it's pretty large, actually. Yeah, it's pretty fast, right? It's pretty quick. The wilds of Charlotte, we get decent internet, I guess. Um, let's see here. And then, you know, I'm running, I was running 15.209, but let's stick to 07, maybe. Um, then I don't want to run it, I just want to mesh it. Let's mesh it real fast. Stephen, quick yeah. question. Yes. So if you want to run on an older version or like a latest version which comes later, do you think you now we will be able to you know, uh, run it on the platform? Yeah, we should Not be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't tested 09 yet. We, we can run 07 and 09 real fast and just kind of see what that, what that can do. Um, now, I mean, 2 million cells, I mean, how much RAM do you think we'll, we'll need for something like that? Um, so, this yeah, one so right I think 60 is, is good. Is 60 gigs. I think that's enough RAM? But we, we can always go higher, uh, maybe, you know, uh, somewhere around 256, half a, half a terabyte. Around 256? Yep. Let's see, that, that's the Emerald core type, and that's one core, let's change to a node. That's 144, so 256, I need more than four gigs per, um, four gigs per core, let's try this one here. Um, and that's one node, 352, that should be adequate, right? Yeah, that's adequate. All right, um, and let's let's go ahead and submit that. Um, now, 
while we get this running, should we also test the case for this this new patch of star CCM plus um, of 150209 um, just to see if it has results, a difference in results on that? Yeah, that makes sense, you know, with version changes or if that is a reason we have been running with a different version that helps to validate. All right, so let me change that real fast. Oh, it's under software, right? Of uh, two. And mixed precision is fine, right? We don't need double precision for this. Yeah, mixed is fine. Okay. All right, so this should we're looking at both both versions here. We can see what that does um, while that starts. Now, I uh, you know I, I've looked at this previously uh, before we change the mesh size here. Uh, um, so let me bring that back up uh, while this while this begins um, starting server. So it's already it's already starting there. Okay. Um, well, let me show you. Um, I have results on this one here. Um, I don't know. I don't know how good they are. Um, you know, this is. I'm looking at the velocity here, but we're, we're we're trying to determine whether or not this will do okay in this this uh, this atmospheric environment. Um, I put, as far as I can tell, there are intelligence is showing that the air uh, within this this planet is 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 mostly um sulfur dioxide does that i mean it's a pretty toxic environment does that seem you know based on what you've heard accurate yeah that's what my intelligence has been telling too so i think it's going to be a dense planet uh, uh it's way different than what we have been used before um so having said that uh, what are the typical operating conditions that you think that uh, we should evaluate the design for um well i put it as as a velocity of you know 10 meters per second going in there um because i mean we're, we're is that is that a decent design point sure obviously we would like to evaluate light guess per second but you know since we can't do that we'll just stick with 10 meter per second for now okay all right so that's almost running because i want to see what this looks like with the finer mesh um i have you know, I have some some a drag coefficient here that I've plotted um, for the X-wing. Now, have have you done the Millennium Falcon? Have you have you? I mean, I've obviously I'm working on the X-wing team. Have you worked on the Millennium Falcon? Do you have anything I can work on off of for that? Um, sure. Yeah. So I'm just put the values that I have. The values that I have are about like you know somewhere closer, or even like I think uh, you know it has a, like higher drag than this one. So probably this design is what we need to use for our attack. Do you have, do you have I mean you have numbers on that? Do you have a job you could you could go ahead and share with me so I could, I could take a look at that? Yeah, I think sure I have shared the job with you. You can share the job with me. I did. Okay. Oh, you did. All right. Yes. So, Brush my screen here and make sure I can see your job. Um, reload. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, okay, so if you don't here. see it, probably I can give you the job ID. You can, you know, probably access it from uh, that. I see too. Falcon. Is that is this what you wanted to share with me? Yeah, the Falcon and the Falcon asteroid are what I wanted to share with Falcon you. Falcon solved. All right, so I want to add that to my desktop because I'm, I want to make sure that my setup is correct there. So let me see if I can add that. Uh, let's see, too many buttons on my screen here. Uh, let's add that to my desktop and hopefully uh, I can compare my, my inputs and make sure we're good with that one. Um, okay. All right, so let let me take a look at that one here, and let's see. I want to go to my oh, here's my here's your Falcon Salt. Oh, still decrypting over the uh, the Rebel Internet here. Okay. All right. So I mean, so what were, what kind of drag numbers are we getting for the Million Falcon in this plan, in this situation? So I'm getting somewhere a point seven point eight. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm at point 0.5 oh. on that. Um, I mean, I guess that makes sense, right? Yeah, and also, you know, the operating conditions uh, may be different too, right? So I think we can yeah. we can establish that. Okay, so let's, let me see if I, that's been decrypted all the way by the Rebel Internet here. Um, okay, there's your job there. Let's take a look at that. And did you have a do you have a plot for that, or how do you, or is it monitor? Well, let's just see what you got here. Um, your mesh. Take a look at that one. And make sure that that's coherent there. Um, at the same time, you know, let's, you know, let's assume, let's assume this mesh job here is good. Let's go ahead and start solving. Because, I mean, we, we really need to get fast on this, on, on, um, Get fast on, on getting some results here. So let me get your, um, I need to change this. So let me get your job you shared with me and let's let's um, add in. So you shared, oh yeah, an asteroid yours. That's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, I me, want to evaluate different operating conditions. Now what if, if we travel through an asteroid field also? So that's like, you know, iterating the design and just collaborating on the fly. Okay, so I want to change my inputs and I want to run it. Okay, unsolved. Um, so how many how many cells is your is your simulation? Mine how many, is uh, how many volumetric cells? Four million cells for this model. Four million. So what's the yeah. metric? Twenty five thousand cells per core, right? So four At least 160 cores to to scale efficiently. So mm -hmm. um, there's 180 cores. Is Emerald the best choice in that? I mean, do you have a lot of do you have MPI? Uh, is it real sensitive to your to your uh, InfiniBand connection or MPI connection? Yeah, I would want to run on like InfiniBand, you know, so that the network is faster. Okay. So let me let me put this yeah. on an InfiniBand option then, because um, I mean I'd I'd rather Get this thing done. Steve, and Stephen, quick question there. So I know you're looking at 180 cores. So is that the max that we can go on the platform? Oh, so we, I, I mean, Bob's your uncle, right? Uh, we can do whatever we want here. Um, you know, you think that would be? I'm kind of a CFD novice. Is this kind of a, a good number? Is this too much, or is this good? Well, no. I was just curious. What is the max that we can do for oh. now for this run? We can just stick with like. Well, um, I stopped clicking at 960-ish. So okay. I could probably go higher than that too uh, with permission from the Rebel IT group. Um, so let's go, I mean, is is uh, yeah, 240, let's just do that, okay. I think you may know. So the IT wants to ensure that you need to have the license in check before running the job. I have a license. All right, so let's go ahead and submit that. Um, okay, all right, that's running. So we're gonna have your Falcon with the asteroid and we're looking at the coefficient of drag on that one. Um, and then I can go back to my job list here for the, oh, it's already completed the X-Wing mesh. Um, and I can just verify that it ran. Okay, so it definitely ran um, in parallel on that. And I've got a meshed file here and I wanna rerun this, um, this new mesh I wanna run real fast and then I'm gonna uh, have, to, have to break contact here. So here's the one we just meshed and I want to run it now. And I want to do the same InfiniBand connection uh, with that you have on yours. We're good. 
Uh, we'll do, let's do this guy here with the higher InfiniBand and let's jump it up. And there we are. Now we're mesh, now we're running that uh, X-Wing mesh. All right, so we've, we've run, we're, we, we've looked at both and we're both kind of working together on this. So you said in in total your final uh, uh, drag numbers for your Millennium Falcon were 0.7. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. All right, so I'm at 0.5. So it seems like the X-wing and that 0.7. That's that's you know that's not the design change with the asteroid. That's that's the uh, in space kind of like this, right? Yeah, that's the baseline design without any okay. alterations. Okay, so um, uh, it seems like the X wing would do a little bit better on this dense, um, this dense environment. And I mean, and later on we can do some calculations on what that force pressure would be on the fuselage, uh, just to make sure we're not crushing anything on that. Um, but okay, so I mean, that's uh, we, we we didn't have much time uh, for the for the rebel analysis, but we got some changes done and we got to add in some 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 asteroids and all. Um, so we're going to hand it back over to you, Julie, um, and, and help us uh, with the last part of this. All right. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Uh, if the Sith hadn't have taken over our webinar capabilities, then we would have seen that they were working. Uh, they can pass the job off to each other, and one can run the simulation themselves, and Madhu would have adjusted the mesh. But you can see how it's easy to pass back and forth a project. Uh, through the Rescale platform. And before we leave, we're just at the end here. I did want to make sure that we answer our questions. We'll first start with Matthews. It looks like we have a second one after that. Matthew asks, and this is for Stephen, can you discuss pricing models? Will the use of larger clusters or higher quality hardware via uh, Rescale HPC cost more for a given project? How much more? Stephen, are you with us? Can you answer that? Yes, absolutely. Great question. Um, so our base uh, charge is on core hour. So it doesn't matter how many, um, you know, what size cluster you're going to run. It's all based on core hour calculations. Now, that being said, we use a volume-based uh, pricing method. So the more you consume, uh, the larger a discount you can you can procure. Um, so I mean, as you can imagine, with 40, what was that number? What was the millions of, of core hours there, uh, Jolie, that we used since COVID? 40. 40. Is it 40? 40 million. Wow. Okay. So if you imagine all that, we we go to the uh, the public cloud providers and and, and try to you know pull everybody together in terms of of leveraging a discount and so we're volume based pricing uh, but uh, short answer or long, short answer is that no matter what size your your cluster is it's same core hour cost I'm sorry this is same core hour cost per core hour right so okay thanks Stephen uh, we have a question from Tom when will storage be available to everyone the website says it is still in beta Stephen. Um, that is a product question, but I know it's on a roadmap and actually being worked on. So I suspect in the next quarter or so, it should be uh, ready to go. I know we're, we're preview previewing it internally and there's some bugs are working out, but um, it's pretty close. Um, that's the most I can say without being on the product team. Great, does anybody else have any more questions? I'm not seeing anything else pop up there. So, oh, we do have somebody else, hang on. Uh, this is from Marco. Oh, Marco, I hope your audio got working there. He says, I'm interested in connecting batch processes running in Rescale Cloud to STARS GUI client, either on Rescale, using its GUI service, or on my own local machine. Is it possible? I assume you're referring to client server mode, and we definitely can make use of that on the platform. Uh, we have what we call end-to-end -end desktops, which allow you to, you know, choose as many cores as you want to run the back end, use client server mode and use the GUI. Um, you can also SSH in and establish a connection um, uh, to, your, to your running job as well, if that's what you would like to do as well. Great. I don't see any more trickling in here. So if nothing else po pops up, oh, thanks Eva for the, the kind comment. Nothing else pops up. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Have a pleasant day and may the cores be with you. <laughs> Bye.